Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous, over-the-top, beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization in paradise in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York on this gorgeous Sunday morning, September 15th. 2019 as I kick off the last week of both my 50s and the last week of the summer of 2019. So uh, I woke up on this gorgeous day thinking, you know, maybe I will just skip the doomsday sermon today and just head out on this beautiful day with my little dog and get out there and enjoy it while I still can instead of going back down here into the Doomosphere. But of course, I can always depend on my tribe. So I get up out of bed with no Doomsday Sermon or Chronicle of the Collapse for Monday. You know, what I love about this is that I, you know, I, I wear both hats during this uh, every every Sunday morning so I can like compare the numbers between uh, the two channels as it were. So anyway, I got up with no with, with nothing ready, uh, nothing prepared, thinking, okay, maybe I will take a day off. but uh, then I open up and, and I have like five, of my alert listeners sending me various uh, chronicles of the collapse and sermons of, of doom. Uh, I do want to briefly mention, you know, <clears throat> a bunch of you are, you know, are still sending me this story uh, from the New Yorker uh, by Jonathan Franzen. And now you're beginning to send me responses to the article uh, from from other media commenting on the article in New York Magazine, uh, the excellent article by Jonathan Franzen, who just spells it out that the war has been lost, that climate change will pretty much kill us all. Uh, <clears throat> and good for the New Yorker. Uh, for having the cojones to publish that, but th this whole th th this whole article uh, and surround and, and all the controversy surrounding it is being so well covered in other parts of the Doomosphere. Uh, Kevin Sandbloom is covering it. Way I know that guy that we do not talk about. Uh, he is covering it. Uh, so I will actually just just say go over there and listen to that other guy. Uh, you know what's left to be said. Jonathan Franzen said it already. If you have not read that excellent article from, uh, you know, from the New Yorker, which I was going to read last week for my sermon, but then Kevin literally uh, beat me to the punch, what was it, about two hours before I was ready uh, to go. So anyway, j just so you know, why is, uh, why am I being so quiet on one of the biggest doomsday sermons to uh, hit the mainstream media in, uh, you know, certainly in 2019. Uh, that pretty much explains it, that, you know, there's only so many ways you can say it. But uh, we're going to turn our attention. And, and of all the choices that I have today from my alert leaders, I am going to say thank you to uh, alert uh tribes member, uh, Brother JJ from right here in the Finger Lakes. I uh, hope we will be seeing Brother JJ at my birthday party one week from today. Uh, but in the meantime, Brother JJ has <clears throat> shared with me, and I'm getting ready to share with you this excellent, 
essay, uh, this op-ed from Truth Out, not Truth Dig. You know, even I have a hard time separating Truth Out from Truth Dig. Uh, they're both excellent websites. And this is from a fellow I have never heard of, but we need to get here on the show. This uh, fellow's name is Justin McBrien. Never heard of this man's name before. Justin McBrien is a doctoral candidate in global environmental history at the University of Virginia. And what is on Justin's mind today here on Truth Out? This is not the sixth extinction. It is the first termination event, which is exactly what it is. And uh, I'm going to, well, you know me, I was getting ready to say I'm going to try just to read this through without breaking into Justin's fine sermon, but I'm going to have to break in uh, at a point or two. Okay, take it away, Justin McBrien. <clears throat> Tell us about the first extermination event. From the insect apocalypse to the biological annihilation of 60% of all wild animals in the past 50 years, life is careening across every planetary boundary that might stop it from experiencing a great dying once more. But the atrocity unfolding in the Amazon and across the Earth has no geological analog. To call it the sixth extinction event is to make what is an active, organized eradication sound like some kind of passive accident. This is no asteroid or volcanic eruption or slow accumulation of oxygen in the atmosphere due to cyanobacteria photosynthesis. We are in the midst of the first extermination event, the process by which capital has pushed the earth to the brink of the Necrocene, the age of the new necrotic death. For some 500 years, capitalism's logic of ecogenocidal accumulation has presided, presided over both the physical eradication of human and non-human life and the cultural eradication of the languages, traditions, and collective knowledge that constitute life's diversity. It necrotizes the planetary biosphere, leaving behind only decay. It burns the practically unrecoverable library of life and eradicates its future masterpieces simultaneously. <clears throat> it inflicts not just physical destruction, but psychological grief and trauma as people witness their lands go under the sea, <clears throat> get immolated by fire, and drown in mud. The first extermination event has now produced such a nightmarish world that even temperature maps scream in agony. <clears throat> and what they use to illustrate this sermon is the global temperature map, which looks like, uh, you know, basically a <clears throat> vision of hell. The specter of the first extermination might halt us all, but it does so with stark disparities 
mapping the geography of capital's historical inequities. Small island states formulate plans to relocate their populations already existentially threatened by rising sea levels. Extreme weather events like hurricanes Katrina and Maria, I think he wrote this right before uh, Hurricane Dorian, disproportionately affect low income and communities of color producing far higher casualty rates compared to other disasters of their magnitude and whose effects are often doubly disastrous as nearly half of these communities live in proximity to toxic sacrifice zones. Droughts and famines such as in Syria and Yemen exacerbate conflicts and force migrations of people, the vast majority women and children, while eco-fascists mobilize the effective politics of grievance to turn capitalism's climate emergency to their own advantage, sloganeering about trees before refugees while calling for mass murder. And I'm not going to stop with a comment here. <clears throat> Yet, most popular discussion of the sixth extinction still indulges in sweeping catastrophic pronouncements about humanity writ large, often failing even to mention the word capitalism, much less account for its centrality to the historical production of mass extinction. Environmental historian Jason W. Moore's work, and uh, you can find my interview with Jason W. Moore on either one of these channels you might be tuned into. Just go search for Jason Moore for our hour-long interview when uh, Jason Moore encapsulates his lifetime of work. <clears throat> anyway, environmental historian Jason W. Moore's work has shown that capitalism is not merely an economic system, but a world ecology searching to exploit cheap natures a process that must perpetually reassemble life to penetrate more and more frontiers of potential profit, capital must reproduce its means of production through its perpetual destruction. The fundamental importance of the search for cheap nature and unpaid labor to historical capitalist development has been well explored by scholars. It was not the Industrial Revolution and its production of the doubly free wage laborer, but, rap but racialized enslavement, mass witch hunts, and destruction of indigenous peoples and, in, and ecologies that produced the conditions for capital to thrive. Through to the present, accumulation of capital has proceeded by the violent dispossession or outright murder of peoples, followed by the necrotic extraction of resources that destroys its local ecology for the sake of accumulation. The cumulative result of this process, replicated across the globe, have come to affect deep time transformations to life at the planetary scale through its very erasure. This is how capital capitalizes on its own catastrophes. 
sustaining the production of life under its aegis every day and accelerating the death of life across the earth. This is no creative destruction. It is simply self-annihilation. It is for this reason that global attention has turned to the Amazon this year. Well, for about a week. Perhaps the fires will consume the last vestiges of the fantasy of an ossified international liberal order capable of stopping this planetary crisis. A ghoulish faction of petty autocrats takes stage for the final act, exemplars of cacistocratic, and he has links to all these, I'll have to, I've never heard the word cacistocratic decadence, and the apothesis of a toxic sludge of decaying neoliberalism, climate catastrophe, white supremacy, and conspiratorial gibberish. President Trump and Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro are caricatures of the first extermination event. History's tragedy now runs concurrent with its farce, the smirk of the tabloid huckster, the new face of the banality of evil, but truly they are two sides of the same coin. Hmm. Green capital, yes, green capital is simply the fetishized, phantom-like objectivity of capital's absolute necrosis. It is not a contradictory attempt to sustainably square the circle of endless accumulation or save capitalism from itself. Rather, it, I mean, I mean this, this whole Green New Deal and crap, what he's talking about, rather, it is another form of accumulation that sees the destruction capital wreaks as an opportunity for further profit. Branding itself as a solution to this destruction, it further incentivizes its continuation by existing only as another option for accumulation when other avenues are closed off. It would cease to exist without the necrotic entropy to which it owes its reason for being. <clears throat> As its monstrous appetite begins to consume the people who previously benefited from its machinations, capital must seek to confuse, turn incoher incoherent, become conspiratorial, point toward ethno-cultural regeneration through violence, and catabolically eat its body piece by piece in order to survive. Like a hostage taker with a bomb strapped to its chest, capital demands our acquiescence or it will hit the self-destruct button on Spaceship Earth. But its threats are hollow. Capital is not greater than life. It will never subsume it entirely under its will. It might dream of Mars and nanobots for new frontiers of commodification, but all it has left to hawk are bunkers. The dire threat of the first extermination 
opens a horizon of possibility to finally destroy what has precipitated it, the rule of capital. The first extermination event is not the history of some unstoppable common ruin of the contending classes, nor is there any inevitability to its final outcome, despite what he has been saying for the last 20 minutes. The indulgence of a fashionable posture of apocalyptic cheek, the lamentation of learning how to die in the Anthropocene, or other such maudlin navel-gazing elegies for civilization, which means Western civilization, because, of course, its collapse is all that matters. All this kind of literature on our ecological crisis is the greatest victory for the ideology of necrotic capital today. Focusing on a dystopic future allows the privileged to ignore the dystopic horror that already exists today. For a great many people, and, and of course non-people, on this planet, as philosopher and environmental activist Kyle Powers White writes, many indigenous people have long lived in a dystopian Anthropocene. It is here, now, yesterday. They have also long fought an existential war against it. The great historical struggle against capital's first extermination has been and remains the struggle for land and the rights of the commons. Indigenous nations account for less than 5% of the global population while protecting 80% of its biodiversity. Indigenous water and land protectors, whose campaigns are often led by women, face a far higher rate of assassinations and state violence compared to non-indigenous activists in the global north. From the Lenca people's victory in halting the Aguazarca hydro dam on the Rio Gualquerque to the Lumads fight in the Philippines against the expulsion from their ancestral homes for mining, indigenous people are on the front lines of the war against necrotic capital. It is their struggle that created the theory and praxis of fighting the first extermination event. Any extinction rebellion must follow their lead. Anyway, uh, almost amen, Justin McBrien. And uh, guys, I, I'm, I, I'm just going to make a, a couple of points. Once again, I just need to point out that just because I choose somebody's uh, essay uh, for one of my chronicles of the collapse or especially a doomsday sermon does not mean I agree with 100% of everything that the uh, you know that my fellow doomers uh, say in their essays. Now I do agree with the vast majority uh, of what Justin just said here, and while I do agree with pretty much every single thing that he said about capitalism. Uh, what he fails to say uh, is, is that every single form of, uh, of economic theory, political whatever, from, from the time we climbed down from the trees, that way before 
capitalism or money was, was ever invented. Uh, it, it, it makes no difference. Now, obviously, capitalism is a particularly virulent, cancerous form of a monetary political system. There, there is no arguing that. However, uh, if, if he's suggesting that going from capitalism to socialism, communism, whatever, is going to make any difference on a planet of uh, whatever, however many billions we really are at. Nobody knows what the population of this planet is. But to have this entire uh, this entire essay without ever mentioning the word overpopulation. Uh, I, you know, I really want to get Justin on the show uh, and ask him how he could have written about the great first extermination without mentioning the word overpopulation. And, uh, of course, uh, I, I think I'm on the record for saying that I do not agree with uh, Justin's, uh, and I've said on the record, with, with Derek Jensen's. The main point where I veer from Derek and, and Justin is uh, this, this whole what I call the myth of the noble savage. Uh, but I'm not going to get off on my own sermon and chronicle of the collapse by uh, getting into the myth of the noble savage. Uh, humans are bloodthirsty savages. Okay? We have been killing each other and more importantly, killing our fellow earthlings, uh, you, you know, from the, from the day we, we, we were probably doing it when we were still living in the trees. Uh, but good Lord, when we climbed down from the trees, the trouble began on this planet when we were all indigenous people when the world was 100% populated by indigenous people. We were bloodthirsty savages in the Anthropocene. The first great extermination was in full swing before capitalism ever hit the scene and took it uh, into the stratosphere. But uh, that's all I'm going to say about that because it is a spectacularly gorgeous day here in the uh, collapse of global industrial civilization. And I need to get out there with my little dog and enjoy this beautiful day while I still can. And I encourage you to do the same. Bye, guys.